Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, members and officers. Welcome to the Planning Committee. In the interest of safety, if the continuous fire alarm sounds, please evacuate the room and the public gallery by the stairwells. Do not attempt to use the lifts. Please assemble by Queen Victoria's statue in front of the civic offices. In order to comply with the Portsmouth Cultural Trust fire marshal regulations, please remember to sign out when leaving the building after today's meeting. For those of you who have not attended this committee before, I will explain the running order. After a brief announcement, and then after the committee members have declared their interest and agreed the minutes of the previous meeting, I will announce each item and ask those of you who are here to make a deputation to come and sit at the table. I'll do that for each item. After the planning officer has made the presentation for the application, individual deputies will have six minutes to express their views, and joint deputies will have 12 minutes between them to make their views known. After which, you will take no further part in the proceedings unless we need to ask a question to or to clarify a statement that has been made. When this has been completed, members will ask questions, make comments, and the decision on the application will be made. Both members of the committee and members of the public are reminded of the need to consider material planning matters and not to refer to any personal information about other members of the public. May I draw everyone's attention to the fact that this meeting will be live streamed, that is filmed, from a camera at a fixed location at the back of the meeting room, and the recording will be on the Council's website. The camera will mainly capture the backs of those making deputations, but there will be some footage of those making deputations as they approach and leave the table, where the microphones are located, and of people entering or leaving the room while the meeting is in progress. Members of the press and public are also permitted to record the meeting on the understanding that it neither disrupts the meeting nor records those stating explicitly that they do not wish to be recorded. Finally, may I ask everyone to use the microphones provided when they're speaking. The on-off button is the single button to the right. Press it down to go on and a red light comes on. Press it down to go off and the red light goes off. Before we commence, I would like the people on the table to introduce themselves so that the members of the public may know who is here. I am Hugh Mason, Councillor for St Jude Ward, and I am the Chairman of this afternoon's meeting. Hello, my name is Peter Bolf and I'm the Deputy City Solicitor. Jeremiah Smith, Democratic Services, taking the minutes. Uh, Councillor Steve Pitt, Central South Sea Ward. Councillor Susie Horton, Central South Sea Ward. Councillor Claire UD, Charles Dickens. Councillor Frank Jonas, Hillsey Ward. Ken Alcombe, Brayton and Farlington Ward. Luke Stubbs, Eastern and Carries Ward. I'm Rebecca Wilkman, Principal Planning Officer. Uh, Claire Upton Brown, Head of Planning. Thank you. Before we get to business, a sad announcement. Those of us who have been around a long time may remember Chris Dale, who was the administrative manager of the development control section before he retired in 2007. He was a gentleman who gave long and faithful service to planning within this city. He was unfortunately involved in a tragic road accident uh, in Northern Parade and subsequently died. He was 71 quite a young man then, and leaves a wife, a daughter, a son and two grandchildren. I think it is appropriate to mention him and also to have it minuted um, how concerned and upset many of us were who knew him to know of his untimely death. And so I'd be grateful if that could be minuted. Right. We now come to this afternoon's meeting. First of all, are there any apologies for absence? 
No, it looks as if we're all here. Councillor Are there any declarations of members' interests? Sorry, Sorry? Sorry Chair. Um, Councillor Donna Jones is represented by Councillor Frank Jonas today. Oh, my. <laughs> Welcome, Frank. <laughs> You're so often here that I assumed you were a full member of the committee. Chair. Yes. Uh, Councillor Lynn Stagg is away on holiday and did notify, I believe. Right, you are unable you. to secure a replacement. Thank you. Right. Declarations of members' interests. Are there any to be declared? Nope. You have before you the minutes of the previous meeting, which was held on the 20th of June air in this room. I will take them page by page for accuracy. Page one, page two, page three, page four, page five, page six, page seven, Page 8. Since there are no questions on the minutes, I will sign those as a correct record of this meeting. Of that meeting. Are there any matters which are not otherwise covered on the agenda which are arising from that meeting? No, thank you. So we now come to item four on the agenda, updates on previous planning applications by the Assistant Director of City Development. Uh, Chair, the uh, <clears throat> only up update I have this afternoon is just to update members on the appeal relating to Brunel House. Uh, members will recall it was um, an application for ex changes to the external appearance of the building that was um, refused. Um, the appeal was allowed um, there was also an application for costs. That application was not successful, so there was no award of costs. Um, also, just again as an update, and I will bring um, a, a, a more detailed report to members and potentially offer some training, but the National Planning Policy Framework uh, document was published yesterday along with guidance on viability. Um, so both of those will be national guidance and policy for you, for you to consider in planning applications and also will guide the way we deal with viability assessments in but at the, both the plan making level and the planning application level going forward. Thank you. Any questions? No. We move forward to the planning applications before you. I intend to uh, take number one and number six uh, first, sequentially, because they both deal with Wadham Road. I believe we have uh, Councillor Peter Harris, is he here? Councillor Peter Harris said that he would be coming to attend for these items. He will be in attendance, in which case it is probably best to leave that to see whether he turns up for those items. Okay. My apologies to the um, deputies who have come for number 69 Wadham Road, but we will wait until Councillor Peter Harris arrives. So we will move on to item. Okay. <laughs> She'd forgotten. <laughs> okay. We're now going to do item two, which is number two, Raglan House. Uh, we're going to carry on with two. Then, Councillor Peter Harris, we are going to do numbers one and six sequentially. Uh, will Mrs. Bernice Godley please come to the table? I'm doing two. Because I have to go down to play the Harris is late. Sorry? 
Well, when we ask you for the deputation, at the moment, just sit there, relax, and listen to the uh, uh, presentation by the officer. Right. Okay, this application relates to 2 Raglan House, located at 4 Clarence Parade, South Sea. The application is re retrospective um, application for installation of replacement external fire escape. <coughs> the application relates to flat 2, which occupies ground and first floors within a three-storey terrace property which is located to the northeast of Clarence Parade, facing onto the Grade 2 listed South Sea Common. The rear of the property abuts Auckland Road West, and at present there are a large number of garages accessed from this road, together with a relatively large garden. An external staircase has been recently, in December 2017, erected without planning permission to the rear of the large garden. Uh, that's the principal level of elevation of property fronting Clarence Parade. It's a substantial property, and as is the same with a number of properties, it has been subdivided into flats, and a number of them do have existing staircases at the rear to provide um, a means of uh, alternative entrance and exit. Um, it's noted this staircase replaced an existing staircase, which did have permission granted in 1994. These pictures illustrate the staircase which was there prior to the replacement staircase. Um, as you can see, it's a cast iron staircase. Um, it has a steeper gradient, um, and it's noted that the height hasn't changed, um, the position hasn't changed, but what has changed is the length um, of the staircase. So these plans show the um, staircase that was there. As you can see, it's much more uh, the gradient is more steep and the change that was made um, which they seek to regularise today is includes a midway platform and therefore the gradient um, has been reduced. Uh, this photo illustrates the relationship with the new staircase with flat 2 and flat 1. Flat 1 is located at ground level. The window now does intersect um, a bedroom window located to flat one, uh, which shows more clearly in this photo, due to the midway platform and increasing in depth by 1.2 metres. This photo was taken from inside flat one and it shows how the, the new staircase goes across uh, a bedroom window of flat one. The bedroom window is non-opening obscure glazed. It's noticed there is a second bedroom window located uh, facing on the north, uh, facing north. <clears throat> it's noted that the um, property is located in the seafront conservation area. Given the existing staircase and a relative little change of the new staircase, um, the local planning authority consider the replacement staircase except for in design terms and in accordance with policy PCS 23 of the Portsmouth Plan. Um, although it's noted um, the staircase has had more of an impact on the bedroom window to flat one and um, however given there was an existing staircase already there it's, it's thought that there is on balance not a significant harm to amenity. It's therefore, um, it's therefore um, recommended for conditional permission. Right, thank you. Mrs. Godley, you have six minutes to make a presentation. I believe you have some photographs which you wish to present to the committee. Yes, present them that way. <laughs> yes. 
Dear committee members, I'd like to apologise for my absence, but I am on a family holiday which was booked months ago. I have asked my colleague, Benny Godley, to read out a letter. In November of 2017, I had a conversation with Mrs Karen Rule regarding replacement of the fire escape from my first floor residence to a rear garden and was reassured that the replacement would not be a lot different to the stairs that's been removed and that would be more or less like for like. To my horror, I came home from work just before Christmas of 2017 to observe a steel staircase one inches away right across one of my main bedroom windows. It also ran along my entire bedroom wall, photographs applied. It transpired that Mr and Mrs Rule had not applied for planning permission for the removal of the fire escape and its replacement with a more elaborate staircase and were asked by the planning department to put in retrospective plan of application of January 2018. Consent was never obtained from the freeholder and this was a freeholder alteration and I myself never received a certificate B until the 26th of June 2018, six months too late. This was because Mrs Rule had claimed to be the sole owner of Full Clarence Parade rather than a leaseholder and filed a certificate A. Also, the plans which have been submitted are incorrect in that the window to my property was not shown. The plan is therefore deceptive since it has been made to appear that there, was a, a, there is no problem. Sorry. The plan is therefore deceptive since it has been made to appear that there is no problem when you will see that intrudes upon my light, my outlook and my joint of my property. The original fire escape stairs ran from the first floor but ended before they reached my bedroom window and only covered a small part of my bedroom wall as the top of the fire escape ran along my hallway which is a heavy supporting wall so there's no little noise impact. The new staircase does allow a lot more overlooking my courtyard as you can see from the photographs, photographs applied but my major objection apart from the terrible overlooking and loss of my light from my bedroom window is the level of noise generated. The window is only single glazed. I can not only see people's feet walking downstairs, but can hear them hear them as well if they're actually in my bedroom. The footfall of this steel aluminum makes a loud metal thudding noise, but what makes it worse is that when people run down the stairs, the whole staircase vibrates and shakes. The sound goes right across my bedroom wall. My bedroom wall is only single skimmed and offers very little noise insulation. The rear access is used by Mr and Mrs Raw and other family members as their main entrance and, now and exit. Also, the garage is at the rear, so the noise is constant. This happens at all hours of the day and night. I've often been woken up early in the morning by someone running down the stairs or walking upstairs, um, etc., in high heels. But I've been woken up at seven in the morning, having only got to sleep at four. On one occasion, I was woken at five in the morning when the staircase was being bumped down the stairs. Family were calling out to each other very... Sorry, I'm just reading it very quick. Very late one night, someone fell part way down the stairs and make a terrible crashing sound. I was woken up with a joint uh, out of my sleep when this happened with my heart banging in my chest. I have read that Mr and Mrs Rule support the application with the argument that the replacement stairs support better level of health and safety. I find, this quite, I find this quite contradictory as the only thing stopping a foot or object coming to my bedroom if someone slipped or something was dropped in, is because it's a single pane of glass. I have been promised that this would be reported to someone in building regulations, but despite several calls to planning, so far I've heard nothing back on this issue. I've also inquired about double glazing for this window, but was told by a glazier that the stairs are so close to my windows that it would be very difficult, if not possible, to do. Also, as the windows of a soaked arch window, the property is in the conversation area, that it would be possible, that if possible, it would be, it'd be extremely expensive, as only two companies in the UK supply that um, double glazing. Anyway, just the last bit is the three holders now being purchased by all three leaseholders with a third equal share as of the 28th of June 2018. Thank you very much, Mrs. Godley. Members, questions? Councillor Pitt. Could I ask uh, the City Solicitor what, if any, impact the change in the uh, tenure to the property makes? The, 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 the latest change, nothing at all. Um, just a kind of a weird question. Uh, the leaseholder thing you said about all three, three uh, uh, of the freeholder of the building is owned by three leaseholders. Is that only of the 28th of June 2000? That's the only time that's out. Who owned it before? Was it someone else who... Yeah. 
okay. I was just a bit confused. Uh, Councillor Peter Harris. Just a mere so just to remind you, Chair, to use your microphone. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Peter Harris. Oh, Is this Gillen. a fire escape or uh, a main entrance and exit? The applicant has confirmed it's not a fire escape. It is a secondary um, entrance exit that they use to gain um, access to their rear of the property. Councillor Elgum. Thank you, Chair. Other than the perceived health and safety issues of having a, a less steep stair, was any other reason that the old one was removed? Is it sort of rusted or could it have remained in situ? Um, as you say, the main reasons were for health and safety, the gradient was far too steep, but there was also concerns about its integrity, rust, etc. Councillor Stubbs. Mentions in the report about the fence, and it says towards the end that the removal of the fence uh, is not part of this application. Um, so, from a planning perspective, are we saying that that fence, is, as constituted, is not legal as it is, or are you just simply saying it's a property matter about whether it can be put there? Is there any planning issue to do with the fence? No, it's a civil matter. Councillor Udi. Sorry again, probably for Claire. Um, in order to put in a planning application like this, is there a cost involved at the council? Uh, with all planning applications, there uh, are planning fees attached to them which are set at a national level. If I'm allowed. Um, how much does it cost to apply for something like this, roughly? Would you know? I don't know. I don't know Not off the top of my head, but my colleague. £260. £206. Thanks. Councillor Pitt. Um, page 9 is a report at the bottom of the first page on this item under the planning history um, at the very bottom it's uh, changes of use to guest house conditional com permission and then a similar sort of time all on just over the page alterations to premises in order to form external means of escape in case of a fire now that this has been done and clearly indicated by the applicant that this is a second means of access and egress from the property, is that a change of use and therefore the 1994 consent um, is not of any uh, material consideration to us in the decision we're making today? Uh, yes, that's the case. Yes, Councillor Smythe. Thank you, Chair. Would there have been any um, building regulations reason why the staircase couldn't re be replaced as previously done? In other words, was it actually too ste steep and dangerous and would that have not passed building regulations? Um, I did speak to the applicant today. He did say building regs said it was too steep to be replaced like for like. Do we know that that's the case? Um, whilst we can't confirm what conversations have happened with building regulations, I think that is highly likely to be the case. Councillor Pitt. So, tr trying to get to the bottom of this, is it a view from a planning perspective that the staircase that's now been installed is the type of staircase that would need to be installed if a replacement was happening or has the applicant added any degree of design to this that they may have had some flexibility over? Um, in terms of uh, what, what's required, it sounds that what was there before was not fit for purpose so what they've installed now complies with current building regulations. Um, in terms of the flexibility, I suspect that the actual design of the railings may have been their own choice rather than something else, but probably the height of the railings is fixed by building regulations. 
but just to follow up on that, Claire, so the, in, the inclusion of a platform would now be something that we would expect to see as a standard design in uh, the staircase of this sort? Yeah, as a consequence of the design, given the span you've got and the, 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 the tread heights. So, had question from the chair. So, had the replacement been at a slightly more appropriate angle for modern uh, egress, and the hole constructed as a fire escape, which it was originally, without a balcony, that would have been acceptable in planning terms and safety terms, yes? In planning terms, that would have been acceptable. Um, I'm not going to confirm the building reg situation as a planning committee. You can only look at it in terms of the planning merits rather than make a judgment around the building regulations matters. Comments, members? Councillor Smythe. So another question, a supplementary question, if that's all right, so, Chair. Yes, question. Um, would, uh, if it had been built with one run without the platform in the middle and that had been okay with building regulations, would it have avoided the window? If it was a complete like for like, yes, it would have avoided the window. You can see that in the photo on the right, it does miss the window. There's a little leeway there as well, isn't there? For yeah. Thank you. Comments, members. Councillor Pitt. Hmm. We seem to be in a particularly weird situation that we could turn it down on planning terms, but then building regs, then there would need to be a replacement fire escape at least, and building regs could turn around and ask for it to be exactly the same as the one that we've just told them to remove, yeah. which is not helpful. Okay. Uh, Councillor Stubbs. Well, I think we're sort of converging, and certainly from that from that last remark by Councillor Pitt. I mean, I think that the, you know, well, I appreciate the neighbours' um, objections to this, and I wouldn't particularly like if it was right next to me either. From the perspective of this committee and of the perspective of managing development in this city, I think we have to allow it. Um, we're in a situation where they have to have a fire escape um, in some form. Um, it probably has to be at a lesser, uh, um, lesser gradient than in the past. Um, I think that the appearance, they've done what they can on it. I'm going to move the officer report. Councillor Jonas. Can, can I just check with the city solicitor? Is it actually, do they by law have to have a fire escape? This, this property? Yes, they do have fire escapes. They must have a fire escape. Somewhere in them, yes. That, that, not necessarily saying that's a fire escape, but they should have a fire escape. And that's for the brush hmm? That just takes in the brush board, does it? I'd imagine it does, yes. What about the fire escapes from the next floor? They would be subject to whatever the plan says, wherever they go from. I don't know. Right. So they don't need a yeah, they need a fire escape. It doesn't necessarily need to be the same one. It could be other fire escapes within the same building. We just don't have the plans for that. As I read that, that's not a fire escape. That is an egress to and from a premises, as I read the report. Councillor Pitt. I'm still confused in a way because if it's either a fire escape or it's not a fire escape, it appears that in planning terms, what is there now is not a fire escape. Is that correct? I just need to know. It's a secondary means of access rather than a fire escape. It does perform the function, no doubt, of a fire escape being a secondary means of access in the event of a fire. Councillor Udi. It's a question, sorry. Um, we're talking... Uh, I'm just probably being nosy more than anything. Um, given the fact that we've only taken the freeholder's word on the fact that the old stairs might have been too steep, are we able to um, 
go back and talk to actual building regs, knowing if a like for like staircase would pass building regular. I know you said about the building and the planning kind of retrospect. If the committee are uncomfortable with making a decision this afternoon, then you can defer it to get confirmation that the design that you have before you is a result of the need to comply with building regs and therefore you have no flexibility in the design and we can we can defer that and we can come back and categorically confirm that position and then you know that you have no choice with the design it's that design or no nothing at all yeah um, I propose that we defer this so we can get confirmation and everything. Sorry. Thanks. Seconded, Chair. That is proposed by Councillor Udi, seconded by Councillor Pitt. Is there anybody seconding Councillor Stubbs? Uh, Councillor Peter Harris is suggesting we uh, seconding the officer's recommendation. Are there any more comments? Councillor Smythe. I think if we are going to defer, we should extend the question to is there an alternative position that doesn't go across this poor woman's window? So not just ask about the um, building regulation status, but whether there is an acceptable alternative that wouldn't go right the way across this poor woman's um, window. It's a link question, a link comment, but it's not to the same question. It sounds, that sounds a very sensible approach to me as, as your chairman. No others. I will, will go to the vote. The first vote is that we accept the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Stubbs, seconded by Councillor Peter Harris. Will those in favour please show? Will those against please show? That is lost. We now come to the second uh, recommendation that we defer on the grounds which have been uh, set out that we need further information on the actual building requirements and whether there is an alternative route which would avoid uh, blocking this lady's window. And that has been proposed by Councillor Udi, seconded by Councillor Pitt. Those in favour, please show. That then is unanimous. We are deferred for further information. Thank you very much for making your deputation. Members, Councillor Peter Harris, I believe you're making a deputation on this one. Yeah, just um, yeah. on first chair, I have no interest to declare apart from making a deputation on this item. Right. Um, so you're making a deputation. Then, <laughs> members. I intend to take 37 Wadham Road first and then to take 69 Wadham Road. Um, Councillor Harris, after you have made your deputation, you will need to leave and we will call you back to make your second deputation. Can I have the officer's uh, report on 37 Wadham Road, please? Thank you. Oops. This application relates to a mid-terrace property which is on the south side of Wadham Road, uh, which you can see there on the location plan. It's a, uh, it has a, f a sort of small enclosed front forecourt and a garden area to the rear. At the time of the site visit, uh, the property was undergoing renovation and um, the works on the extension to the roof, the dorm extension, were still ongoing. So. I apologise for the photographs, I can't really show you a huge amount of what the uh, internal accommodation is like, but um, so this is from the front, there's a couple of pictures there showing uh, the rear elevation where you can see the scaffolding up for the rear dormer and uh, the rear garden as existing. 
and then internally um, I believe that's all still to be renovated as well but that's the, the, what will be the communal space at the back of the property and some photographs of some of the examples of what will be bedrooms um, when they are done up and they would all have ensuite bathrooms. So the proposal in this case is to change the use of the property from a C4 house in multiple occupation to a seven bedroom house in multiple occupation which changes the use to a sui generis use. This, the C4 use was um, granted permission, I believe actually earlier this year, um, yeah, 9th of April 2018, so uh, that hence why it's still in, in renovation. In terms of the, the actual accommodation that will be created, that you should have the floor plans in front of you because you can hardly see them up there. <coughs> Ground floor would have um, two bedrooms, both with ensuite and the communal lounge dining sitting room. The first floor would have a further three bedrooms with en-suites and the second floor in the loft um, would have a further bedroom, two bedrooms with en-suites again. Just to note that the dormer window has been constructed under permitted development because it's of a size it does not require planning permission and that's why it doesn't form part of this application. Um, in terms of the policy on this one, from the council's database, the property number 37 was the only one that's known to be a house and multiple occupation within 50 metres of this application site. We were asked to review a couple of other properties which you see on the supplementary matters sheet. Um, we have done some research on those. We didn't determine that those were HMOs. So the, um, so the count for this particular application remains that only one property within seven, out of 72 which has a percentage of 1.4. So the policy states if it's over 10% HMOs in an area, a change of use to a sui generis would be resisted. In this case, um, the application accords with the policy because it's only at 1.4%. Um, so th the other matters to consider have been laid out in the report. This application is considered to be acceptable in accordance with the Council's adopted policies and a recommendation is for conditional permission. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Peter Harris, who has. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've basically written it, it's already in the supplementary matters. It's going to focus on three points. Um, firstly, I believe the data on the HMO database is incorrect, and uh, this will probably be seen more into 69 Wadham Road than it will be onto this application. A lot of residents have come to me and they've identified properties that they're saying are HMOs, so we've had them checked out and Jane's actually been very good on that, so I just want to say thank you for that, for the officer's help. Um, the 50 metre radius plan for the property, many residents obviously didn't have access to this online, so can we just um, make sure that obviously that they have access to this information, but also there was inadequate notification towards residents. When I actually surveyed the road itself, knocking doors, um, you had minimal notification and also on lampposts, residents didn't actually have that. So if you actually walk down Wadham Road, it would either have been turned around or ripped off. So a lot of residents actually found out about this application when the work was actually commencing, which I, I, I personally think that's poor show. And I think the residents should have significant time to actually research the area and find out if there are other properties in the area. Um, I'm mainly here for the feeling from local residents so just so you know where this road is, this road is on the cusp of my actual, is on the cusp of Hillsy Ward. It's split down the middle. You have Hillsy one side and Nelson the other. So it was quite a shock when the Hillsy Ward councillors knocking on the Nelson side. It was also quite a shock to the Nelson Ward residents when they realised they didn't actually vote for Frank Jonas in May. They actually voted for somebody else. So it was um, quite a shock to them. But a lot of the in, um, issues that they come up with was with parking. And I find this fascinating that highways do not mention the sheer fact that this area suffers from sheer displacement parking because it's next to an FD parking zone and it does and our councillor Pitt's nodding because he, he probably knows that on what I'm saying is incorrect and they're saying that it's exactly the same as a family dwelling in the house but it's not it's not exactly the same if you've got five unrelated individuals they will bring cars and then if you're going to compound that with the other application down the road you're going to have the same issue so I don't see how highways can just completely ignore the issue of the fact that you've got considerable displacement parking and don't see parking as an issue because it actually it's not actually covering the SPD correctly in my opinion so I, I believe the committee need to look at that from that point of view that I think parking in this instance is actually key and I think 
I find it staggering that the, the officer hasn't actually looked at the parking areas and the parking zones. And I know that's come up here at this committee before, where we've actually looked at applications on that basis and said, actually, no, they do suffer, and they've refused it. So all I'm asking the committee to do today is to look at, obviously, the notification that residents received, which was inadequate, in my opinion, and from discussions with residents, I believe that to be true, and from my own investigations, to look at parking as... as actually a material consideration that it's not following not following policy and also the HMO database is incorrect and I believe that we should be knocking door to door to actually see which ones are HMOs and which ones aren't because at the moment we're not too sure we've had two investigated already on this one on the next application you'll see I think there were six investigated two were found to be HMOs two we're not too sure about you know so it would make a big difference so I think there needs to be more investigation onto these properties thank you Thank you, Councillor Peter Harris. I'll I'd be grateful if you would now retire. I'm not sure, yeah. Councillor Ancom, what is a suitable age for retirement, but I'm sure neither you nor Councillor Jonas nor I have reached that age yet. <laughs> Members' questions. Uh, Councillor Ancom. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have several really. I think the first one is a point Councillor Painter Harris picked up about the highways engineer. The report actually says no comments received. Now that doesn't tell me whether they've looked at it and don't see a problem or they've looked at it and there is a problem, it just says they haven't bothered. Um, which to me is unacceptable. I think, you know, with all the furore that's going on in the city at the moment with residence parking, which uh, I know Councillor Pitt is interested in um, to not have any comments on a road which we know is got problems with it to me is unacceptable so I think it's probably more of a statement than a question but can, I guess if you want it as a question have we chased highways to find out why they haven't given you an answer I'll just explain that one um, the highways office has actually provided us with a sort of standard um, advice in relation to houses and multiple occupation and, and how they assess parking and that's in line with the yes with the, the adopted parking standards document which is what we then refer to in our comments so they don't necessarily provide individual comments on every HMO application because we refer to their their um, their advice their standard advice which isn't supplementary sorry chair which doesn't help when you're looking at specific problems in a specific area, a a bland um, response that is a the usual response isn't particularly helpful, I don't think. But, sorry, Chair, I do have some others, but I'll yes. let other people have a go first if you want. No, you come okay, with right, all of yours, then I'll turn to Councillor Pitt. The, ne the next issue for me is this house could potentially have. 14 people in it, two to a room. I know it's uh, seven rooms, um, but I don't see anywhere on any of the plans a fire escape. And bearing in mind we've just had discussions in the last application about a fire escape for a three story property, what's the situation with a fire escape in a building like this when um, we've just been told in the last application? building regs would require one and on this application we don't have one and there are probably more people in the building than there were in the previous one. The first point I'd make is that uh, it's seven bedrooms and the condition three on the recommendation would actually restrict it to seven occupants so we don't intend it to be occupied by more than seven. No well through our normal enforcement procedures if we were advised that there were more than seven people living there. Um, in regards to the fire escape, that would be a question for building control. It's not something I can answer. Claire may be able to, though. Uh, the HMOs of these natures would not require the installation of a, a fire escape to, on the building. Councillor Pitt. Yes, question, thank you, Chair. Question for Claire. Claire, could you confirm that whenever the Planning Committee has tried to use parking as an issue 
with the regional planning inspector as a reason not to grant an HMO that the regional inspector has taken the very clear opinion that parking is no worse for an HMO than it is for any other uh, property and that uh, such considerations cannot be, be material for this committee. Uh, y yes, you're correct. The inspector has always um, counted any argument we've put on the grounds of um, insufficient parking. Thank you. That's something I totally disagree with, as do others, but nevertheless it is the case. Other questions? Comments, members? Councillor Jonas. Um, this, I haven't got a crystal ball, Chairman, but um, I will say this, and if there are any local residents, the applications, for uh, we, we're taking them separately, but the, for, this one's for seven. They started off with six. They've gone ahead because they, the developers know that um, the, there is a low uptake of HMOs in this area, so they're now going to be granted seven. We've been sitting through this for years. We've got our hands are tied, but I think the residents uh, will catch up with the people of southern Portsmouth that uh, have got a bigger problem with HMOs, and that um, as for the seven large bedrooms only being occupied by seven people and it can be enforced, I've never heard of any of it being enforced, so quite possibly there could be 14 people. There could be 14 extra cars. Even if the family before had three, you could say there's an extra 10 or 11 cars in this place. And that's what they've got to expect. And until the overall policy of HMOs has changed, um, each road or each in this city can take up to the 10%. Thing, and, that, and that's one thing we've got to put up with. But uh, don't let anybody kid anybody. There'll be more people in this place than what uh, they're advertising for, and there'll be more cars in this area. I'm surprised we haven't heard from the developer that, that they will be young professional people. I don't understand what a young professional person is and whether he or she is less likely to use a car than a non-professional person. Highly discriminating. They want young professional people. We've heard from these people before. What's up with some um, wrinklies? Why shouldn't they be living in this place? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that comment. Um, other comments? Yes, Councillor Horton. Just um, a quick one on the communal space. I'm sure it's not breaching any guidelines, but it strikes me that you've increased the number of people significantly, and as we've said, possibly up to 14, whilst halving the communal space. The only thing I think is different is that now everyone's got an ensuite, but that's not very helpful if you've got 14 people in a lounge stroke kitchen. So I think the communal space is really significantly reduced at, at the same time as you're almost doubling the bedrooms. Can you therefore, can you therefore confirm that the communal space meets our sp minimum space standards? Uh, yes, yes, it does, yeah. Councillor Elcombe. Thank you, Chair. Well, really the whole thing's a farce, isn't it? Because, you know, we keep getting these applications. Only in April it was an HMO, um, and now once again we're asking to enlarge it further. No doubt the same thing's happening further down the road. We've heard from our officers that the Highways Department haven't taken a more uh, robust global view of the impact on the whole street of these two applications. They've let us have a standard um, response which um, I find unacceptable because they should be taking into account what parks there now, um, what impact extra rooms would have, extra people would have and the, the whole thing about this is for seven people in seven rooms. Are we going to have somebody on the door saying that they can't bring a girlfriend or boyfriend in for the night? Um, you know, it's ridiculous isn't it because there is no way of telling on any particular day or night how many people are in that house um, whereby you know, the residents who live in the area already will not be disturbed by other people having cars or lack of parking and to me you know the whole thing has become as I said earlier farcical because we know full well 
that if this goes to the planning inspector, he will approve it because his view will be it's one more person than what's there now already agree. And but you know, at some point, this city needs to make a stand and take a different view on some of these applications because we just don't have the room. And you know, we can do all the park and reviews we want unless we actually start doing something else in terms of the controls we can put. I did several years ago suggest that a, a directive be put on planning consent where people couldn't have a permit in a residence parking area. I know this doesn't actually suffer from one at the moment, but there's got to be some way of controlling the amount of vehicles that all these developments are getting. Councillor Pitt. Yes, um, just a bit of reassurance because we're being live streamed that um, I think within the last 18 months I've worked with residents on maybe as many as five or six different properties where they've specifically reported to myself and Councillor Horton that they believe that more people are occupying a property than should and on those occasions private sector housing do go and in, uh, visit those properties unannounced. They do go in and carry out an inspection but it is obviously based on the intel that they're getting through us as ward councillors and through the residents. I've got one right now that we're, we're working on trying to establish if it's being illegally used as an HMO um, and I've had several in different parts of the ward so I think just to reassure anybody that's watching this that it's not that nothing can be done but it does require quite a lot of proactivity around it to stay on top of it and since we have so many of them in our ward it's something that we're very used to doing um, and I'd encourage other councillors to do the same. Councillor Udi. Uh, just for clarification, and Steve, uh, Scott brought that up as well about investigations into property, so maybe there could be a cross-party approach into seeing what actually is going on, because I guess if um, we're not enforcing it as well as we should be, then people will start trying to bend the rules and making putting HMOs in, because as we all know, they make lots of money for people. Well, we need to move this, this one forward. I certainly understand the problems which people have, but I can see no grounds on which, were we to refuse it, it would not immediately be overturned, probably with costs, by the Planning Inspectorate. Because the only grounds which have been brought forward for refusing it are parking grounds, and we know those are unacceptable. I therefore, oh, with some regret, I propose the officer's recommendation. It doesn't need to be seconded from the chair. Are there any other proposals? Okay, I put it to you um, that we accept the officer's recommendation. Those in favour, please show. Those against, please show. The application is carried. Can somebody please call in uh, Councillor Peter Harris for the next item. Sixty nine Wadham Road. Can we have the officer's report, please? This application relates to sixty nine Wadham Road and it's for a change of use from C three dwelling house to C four HMO. The house is related to the southern side of Wadham Road and it relates to a two story mid terrace property. Um, got principal elevation and then some rear elevations there. Um, it would stay on two floors um, with a communal area at ground floor and two bedrooms on ground floor, both with en suites. And then at second, uh, second floor we would have um, another three bedrooms, all with en suites. 
Um, Inside internal uh, photos showing kitchen and what are to be bedrooms, um, bathroom facilities. Uh, the garden was overgrown, so I couldn't get the best photos. Um, okay. um, so the HMO count data indicated one HMO within the 50 meter radius. However, um, six additional HMOs were um, brought to our attention to investigate. Licensing checks were done, history checks were done, um, council tax records were uh, looked at, and a site visit was also carried out by the enforcement team. Um, two HMOs were identified um, in addition to a one, which would bring it to three within uh, the 50 metre radius, bringing the total to 4.11%, still under the 10% threshold. All other matters are set out in report, and um, it is uh, for recommendation of conditional permission. Thank you. Mrs Lowe, would you please make your deputation? Well, I have been in my property since 1977 and what concerns me is with a three-bedroom house that is going to be converted into five bedrooms with ensuite, it's going to have disruption I don't feel happy about that one. Okay, we're going to have extra parking, but then it's going to be what's crossed my mind, a, a strain on drainage, because the, man, the number of people that will be living next door, that will be using the facilities more than a three-bedroom house, okay? And also it will bring noise. I'm 74 years of age now and I'm not looking forward to my old age having a noisy, no, noisy neighbors, if you know what I mean. That does upset me. Does that make sense? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's some we, of the... We will ask I you to answer any questions if any of the members have any questions which they would wish to ask you. We now move to Councillor Peter Harris. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to, on a note, Mrs Lowe is the lady who organised a petition of 86 people signing it. Just, just for your records, uh, this is the lady who actually had all the hard work and knocked all the doors before I did. So I can't, <laughs> I can't fault her for her efforts. So well done. Um, what I'm going to just go over on this one is the notification on this was interesting because I went online, looked at this application, and um, yeah, brilliant. Thank you. That's that's fantastic. And what I'm going to say though, that you know what I'm going to say because I've already said it to you yesterday, that. The 50, meter, the 50 meter radius wasn't put, published online, the houses wasn't published online, you know, you put up a notice saying go to this application online, the residents have in, inadequate information. So if anything, the residents are going on a wild goose chase because they don't have to actually correct the information from the planning department, which I think is actually appalling, in, in, in all honesty. It should have been uploaded, you know, it, and it wasn't. You know, so that, on, on that note, we've already identified two HMOs and that's from me just knocking in what I would call Hillsy Ward boundary. There's, I think, about 100 properties that are actually outside the ward boundary, which I wouldn't have information on. You know, I, I personally believe that with information, the residents can actually look into that list a bit quicker. They've had 24 hours. The residents know the areas much better than the ward councillors, even though we think we do. You know, we get all our information from residents. I, I think we should look into that. That's, that's one point. Again, I'm going to talk about the FD parking zone in Bevis Road. It's actually been opposed by 56% of people that were surveyed, so it actually probably shouldn't be a parking zone, but that's a discussion for another day. It's called severe displacement parking. What's happening there 
is people that are in the parking zone for the likes of Cardiff Road, London Road, London Avenue, North End Avenue. They're literally commercial vehicles. They can't get a permit because obviously they're registered to the company. So they're dumping them in Wadham Road, they're dumping them in Oriel Road, they're dumping them on Gladys Avenue. Again, the parking standards SPD, in my opinion, is not fit for purpose. And I think it should be reviewed. Because at the moment, we're looking at the SPD and we're saying a three bedroom house for two cars which is great, a three bedroom house, but as soon as you put five people in it, all of a sudden, likelihood that's going to come five cars. You know, the logic is there. The SPD is quite frankly out of date. And I think that's something for this committee to push um, the cabinet member for PRED on, certainly, to have that reviewed. And I would ask the committee, actually, after this meeting, to discuss that issue itself. I personally believe, due to inadequate information and notification, that I think this item should be looked at longer. I, I personally think the planning team should look at this because I've identified two HMOs. There's already one we've got a star on that I'm not too sure about. I think Jane said that she's confident it might not be, but I, th I still think we haven't had the information for. And I, I think we should look at that because if I found two, what else is there? You know, and that's just from me knocking residents and speaking to probably about 30 people. And I, I personally think the residents are being shortchanged on this, especially with the information not being online, which is three residents brought up with me over the course of the weekend. So. I personally think that you guys, on this one, you should defer it and look at the application again when, you have the, when the residents have had the correct information. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Peter Harris. Will you now withdraw? I'll come back. Well, you can come back a little later when we've uh, decided one way or other on this one. Right. Members, questions? Councillor Smythe. I think I'd be correct in saying, having approved the previous application, we would already have a, demonstrated a precedent which the inspector, if we had an appeal, would um, use immediately to uh, allow this one. It does seem to me we have to do the same word by both of these, although I do have every sympathy with your fears. Um, and uh, I wanted to comment generally that I think we do need to make sure that we keep strong our team in housing that does look at standards and... Uh, keeps up the standards of HMOs. Some of them are well run and useful places for people to live, but some of them do um, decline and are badly managed, and I hope we can, you can reassure us that we um, have the capacity to do that. So two points. Questions? Councillor Elkham. Thank you, Chair. Obviously, I made a lot of comments last time on a property in the same street. I stand by all those comments. The only thing that really interests me is on this application highways parking have made a contribution where they obviously I'd, I'm tempted to say couldn't bother but didn't whichever the reason on the previous application which again really you know we get the same stuff coming back from the inspector that it's within a bus route etc but we all know you could be right next to a bus stop but some people will still buy a car and use it um, so to me the sooner we can get away from the planning inspector system the better because we are not doing the best we can for the citizens of this city who are slowly and we've got more applications today where we're just cramming more and more people into the same existing spaces your question, Councillor Elkham. What can we do about it? I think that is for Councillor uh, for Mrs. Upton Brown. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, we might be here for the rest of the evening. What I can confirm to members is that there is a report going to Pred on the 31st of July um, for information only, confirming that the parking SPD will be um, reviewed over the next few months so that it comes up in line with the NPPF. Chair, could I remind you we were in comments. I didn't actually have to ask a question. Oh, what? <laughs> I assumed it was a question. Are there any, any questions? <laughs> Councillor Pitt. Uh, yes, the there are a couple of 
uh, issues that were raised um, by the resident making deputation, Mrs. Lowe. So I think it would just be appropriate to interrogate those a little bit, um, and also some of the things raised by Councillor Peter Harris. Um, I think it's fair to say that the council is aware and has been aware for some time that the need for more accuracy of data in the north of the city is something that needs to be addressed. Is that the case? Uh, so, sorry, yes, that is the case. Uh, thanks, just for the record. Um, thank you. And the, um, the sewage and drainage issue will be a building control matter, not something for the planning committee. That, that's correct. Um, and sorry, and that such things as the demographics in the community, paving over front gardens, etc., are not material considerations that we are allowed to take into account in deciding this. That, that's correct. Thank you, Claire. One matter which the uh, deputy raised was the matter of noise. Can you say something about the construction of this property and whether there would be uh, any sense in putting in some, requiring some form of noise attenuation to be inserted? Um, in terms of the construction of the property, um, I think you can see from the, the pictures it's a period property of um, potentially more substantial construction than some modern day properties, um, brick with a tiled roof um, with fairly large rooms, um, so the, sort of the distance between uh, walls to walls is greater than maybe in a modern property. In terms of noise attenuation, um, this wouldn't be something that normally could be controlled through planning. Um, the only thing that you could consider, um, if you were so minded, is whether there would be a sort of retrospective fit of noise attenuation, but that can be quite challenging in terms of actually physically carrying that out on the building and also the effectiveness of it. Any other questions? No, you can't, unfortunately. You, after your deputation has been made, you are not permitted um, to make any further comment. Any questions from members? Comments from members? Uh, Councillor Jonas, then Councillor Udi. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mrs Lowe for coming here today and putting her case and for raising the awareness of your neighbour's concerns. I don't want to pour um, more misery onto you, but uh, if this is granted, which I suspect it is, the next thing is you'll probably get a uh, dormer put in the roof and another couple of people put in there. But I don't want to sound all doom and gloom. Uh, we might have something to say about that, but uh, well done for coming and, and I understand your feelings. Thank you. Councillor Udi. Um, I was going to echo Councillor Jonas's congratulations. It's really lovely when um, someone comes together and a bit of collective action happens and a bit of grassroots movement there. And um, you're a woman after my own heart, definitely, Mrs. Lowe. So thank you for that. Um, just going to mention a couple of things. Um, as much as I, I'm a bit dismayed about the parking because quite a lot of people drive, I personally don't drive. Uh, my husband doesn't either. We live in a flat city. We're quite lucky. Um, other than that, I think uh, to a degree we need to be moving away from parking, being a be all and end all, especially in an age where we're more environmentally conscious. Um, but then you have to look at the wider picture where you look at better ba bus infrastructure because Wadham Road, I know we've got good bus links there, but it's nowhere near train links, to be fair. It's not really that much. Well, you could probably go from Hillsy, but not, man not many buses there, and that's still probably a good half an hour walk to a train station. So it's not particularly useful, um, I think. But that's a wider picture of looking at bus, especially prices of buses uh, for f uh, for a big company in Portsmouth that are running right now, are considerably expensive. And uh, with cheap taxi rides as well, I guess we should be trying to encourage people to travel more by um, public transport. Um, also, we're stuck in a bit of a predicament um, as councillors because on one hand, I particularly don't 
favour HMOs because I know for me it's de it's developers coming in building houses and make it uh, well putting more bedrooms into houses to make the maximum amount of profit but on the other hand I want people to be housed and have adequate housing in the city so it's very hard but um, as you can see I, I feel like this is this is not isn't about um, giving people more housing this is about making as much money as possible um, also, uh, to echo uh, Councillor Smiles' concerns about because we've just spoken on um, number 37, I'm worried if we defer, uh, they could put non-determination and go straight to Bristol at this point, and we couldn't even do anything then because it's, it's kind of a similar application and we can't really do anything I think our hands are tied unfortunately I think I'm going to have to move to follow the officer's recommendations on this one because I think there's not much else we can do and I feel like it will get overturned at, at, yeah so you with reluctance have uh, proposed your officer's recommendation is there a seconder for that Councillor Pitt, thank you. <laughs> Any other observations? Yes. I think there's a case to be made for deferral. Um, you know, we've heard there's been some other HMOs identified, um, some question marks over some others. I think it will be in everyone's interest for this to be looked, at, looked at. I'm cautious that we're looking at an application site in PO2, so none of the additional licensing applies, so it means that the database is quite sketchy. Um, so I will pro propose deferral. Thank you. Is there a second of a deferral? Well, since I think it the Yes, Chair, I think one. had we deferred the first one, I would be supporting Councillor Stubbs in deferring this one. I just think it's somewhat difficult having approved one further along the street to then defer a second one in the same street. I think we're actually shooting ourselves in the foot with that argument. I don't like this. I didn't like the first one. Don't like this one, and I won't vote for them. But equally, I know full well, having been on planning for a long time, that when it goes to the planning inspector, if we did turn it down or defer it, we know full well he's going to approve it. So. In some ways, it's almost a waste of time, some of these applications coming to us, because whatever our feelings as a committee and things we would love to turn down, we're hang, hung, hamstrung because we know the greater authority will overrule us. So, so it is a bit of a difficult. So I'm afraid I can't support Councillor Stubbs because of the first decision. I believe, Councillor Stubbs, the reasons which you were using for deferral were that there was inadequate information on this particular case as to the number of properties which were HMOs. Is that correct? Thank you. I think that does need to be tested and so I will formally second that for you. Um, any other Of course you could make a follow-up comment. I did make a comment after uh, 37 Modern Road mm. that maybe if a planning application came in we could just like maybe send officers in the neighbouring mm. 50 yards automatically and do yes. some investigating of whether these houses are HMOs, mm. especially in areas mm. in the north of the city where you won't find HMOs, more than likely mm. obviously, in, well you could even do it in the south of the city but you're more in, too many HMOs anyway, you'll probably hit the 10% very easily and it'll just be thrown out the window. But in the north of the city, can't we just mm. knock the neighbouring doors if a planning application goes in? Is that something we can incorporate into planning? Sorry, it might take we, up more time and effort. I think we probably don't have enough staff to yeah. do it in every case. But, um, Councillor Pitt. Um, just to be helpful, Councillor Udy, um, because of the density of HMOs in Central South Sea Ward, when applications come in, as ward councillors, we would normally go and put a letter through the adjacent properties wherever we think that there might be a challenge, and that helps information for the residents and takes the pressure off the council staff. Thank you for giving me some advice there. He charges for it. Um, 
Okay. Councillor Elkham. Yeah, Chair, I'd just like to pose the question. Okay, we do some more work, and I'm quite happy to support a deferral. <laughs> it does show that there are more HMOs than have been reported to us. Where does that leave us with our previous application and consent, which those, that same information might have led us to a different decision? I think on your, the difference between the two applications is on your previous application it was already an HMO and you were, you were going to, to an extended one. Right. We now come to uh, the vote. Um, the first vote is for accepting the officer's recommendation. Were that not to be carried, we would go to um, Councillor Stubbs's proposal that we defer it for a very detailed investigation of the number of HMOs within a 50 metre radius. Can I see those in favour of accepting the officer's recommendation, however reluctantly? Those against? Four because uh, having seconded you, I've got to do that. Uh, let, let us try it then. Um, that was inconclusive. It is normal under normal chairmanship rules to keep the matter open. See Citrine, page 132. Um, so we come to the proposition by Councillor... Um, <laughs> yes, the proposition that it be deferred. Those in favour of deferral... Those against? Strange as it may seem, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> We have reached a conclusion that the committee, by a majority, is not satisfied that they have adequate information on the number of HMOs within a 50 metre radius and are therefore deferring this for further investigation. And that is the position that we have reached and that has been approved. Thank you. Just for uh, transparency, I don't think it has any bearing on the matter particularly. It certainly has no um, pecuniary interest in it. Uh, Carl Leroy Smith, the uh, architect of the plans that we've just been had circulated to us, is someone that I know personally, but it has no, will have no bearing on my decision. Thank you very much. Um, can we have the uh, officer's presentation on this? Uh, and could Mr Kitchen please come to the table? Good afternoon, members. So this application relates to 92 Osborne Road. Um, this is a two-storey property, commercial unit, currently in use as a shop. They're located to the southern side of Osborne Road with Palmerston Road Precinct 
uh, the open section and Osborne Road running east-west. The planning permission is sought for the change of use of a shop within Class A1 to a cafe stroke restaurant within Class A3 and the installation of an extraction flue. Uh, just some site photos showing the two-storey premises in here uh, with a bank either side and residential accommodation above. To the rear that opens out onto Ashby Place, the, uh, the car park, uh, with a mix of commercial and residential uses. You have a small rear yard, uh, a metal fire escape, and you can just see what was a previous refuse chute in between the fire escape and residential windows above. This is just showing in a bit more detail the enclosed rear yard and the existing refuse storage facilities. So in terms of the principal, um, policy PCS, sorry, STC4 of the South Sea Town Centre Area Action Plan, which is highlighted there, I won't read it out to you, encourages the siting of restaurant and cafe uses within the restaurant quarter, primarily focused about around Osborne Road and the southern end of Palmerston Road. Now, in the absence of any restrictions on the number of cafes and restaurants within that area, it's considered that the proposed use is acceptable in principle. Internally, it's a relatively small unit, currently comprising retail floor space in here as a jeweller's, uh, with a spiral staircase leading to some office accommodation at first floor level. The proposal is for a two-storey cafe stroke restaurant um, with a kitchen now located at ground floor level um, and an indicative floor plan just showing approximately 42 covers within the building and then rear access uh, with the refuse store and the replacement with the kitchen extraction system and the flue up through the middle of the external fire escape. Now following concerns raised by the City Council's environmental health team about this and other uses um, similar to this within the surrounding area, the application has been amended to relocate the kitchen to the ground floor level away from residential uses above. Um, so you don't then have extraction systems installed directly onto the ceiling below residence. Um, and they've also agreed a reduced opening hours. Um, and with the inclusion of conditions con to control the hours of opening, uh, the use of the rear doors and the extraction equipment, it's considered that the concerns of the environmental health team have been overcome. Now, in reaching this decision, um, I'll just draw your attention to page 16 of the report. There was a very similar application considered by the planning committee recently in Marmion Road, uh, which related to a cafe restaurant with residential accommodation above. Um, the inspector felt that it was an appropriate use, even though it is in a quieter area of the town centre. Um, and then finally, on this slide, just showing that the replacement of the, the chute with a flue, visually very little difference to the external appearance of the building and the installation of the flue and the associated equipment can be controlled through a planning condition. Um, as a result of its siting within the town centre, no objections have been received from the Highways Authority. So members, you have a detailed report in front of you and for the reasons set out, this application comes with a recommendation of conditional permission. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Mr Kitchen, you have six minutes to present your case. Um, Thank you very much for letting me speak today. Um, I'm here representing uh, myself and my wife, Mrs. Georgina Kitchen, as the leaseholder for 94 and 100 Osmer Road. I'm also representing my tenants, Mrs. Maria Orichowski, legal occupier of 94, and Mr. Robert Buckman, occupier of 100 Osmer Road. Um, owner of 98 Osborne Road, which is Mr. and Mrs. Yeshi, um, not West Bank. I'm also representing Mr. El Marouk, which is the freeholder under Rose Bay Development. Um, he holds the whole building. I would like to start by categorically stating that no permission or consent has been given to the shop to change the premises to a restaurant slash cafe, and the external alteration to include replacement of the current rubbish chute to a duck to serve the property have not been given consent Further to that, on the contrary, the reason I'm here today is I was approached by the freeholder before this having been submitted because he was approached by Mr. Sa Marabuto and Mr. Hake Marabuto when they proposed to change the shop. As he refused, he was bombarded with emails, messages, and texts basically threatening him, abusing him. 
I spoke to him on many occasions, including yesterday, and he has repeatedly confirmed that he is not giving any permission to the change of the premises or making any alteration. Um, the alteration that they propose for that will go through the fire escape, which I have pictures here to show you actual size of things with my daughter as scale of little square there is the exi existing duct for the bottom floor and how is that going to connect to the actual rubbish chute without interfering. You also have concern from Nat, Nat West in regards to their fire escape. Um, we have raised concern about you have put condition to the opening. So at the same time that the owner have decided to reduce his proposed opening hours, he has decided to increase by 140% his cafes from the 30 suggested in the original planning statement to 42. So it's basically taking in one hand, giving in the other. And at the same time, how are all these recommendations going to be enforced? Who is going to enforce that the door is going to be stopped and them not using it as the rest place for the kitchen staff, as it stated here in the planning that it's a small kitchen? How is it going to be enforced that the noise and all the opening hours, because you said no opening hours, but as it's a restaurant, you have about an hour preparation in advance, an hour preparation and cleaning after. That's after customers come and go. We would like to know and understand who will enforce it because the applicants for that are the same applicants that were refused an application for 11 Clarendon Road, which is now opening and operating in complete disregard to your decision, which is known to the council enforce enforcement. They are doing it, and we are here today discussing an alteration where they have never gotten, given any consent from the freeholder. Taking into this into consideration, I'd like to know how is all that going to be enforced. We also want to understand why is the applicants, if we take them into consideration, why are their financial gains from changing the business more important than the livelihood and the living conditions of their residents living there? Uh, we currently rent the two property house to supplement our family income. So by giving them permission, you're going to hinder myself. And also, there are currently saturation of restaurants slash cafes in the area. There are two vacant properties on Marmion Road, 29 Marmion Road, and 17 Marmion Road, that is owned by the same owners. And they've, you've refused them, they went to appeal, they got permission on the appeal, and that's currently sitting vacant in Marmion Road. Um, thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Kitching. Members, questions? Councillor Udi? Um, I think I have two. Um, I did bring it up in a planning briefing as well, but I just want confirmation of some stuff. Number one, I said freeholder has not approved the change of use. So let me get this right. Freeholder owns the whole structure of the building. So do the developers who's put in the planning application, do they own the leasehold to the shop? <laughs> okay, so... The Sorry, Sorry. Okay, so there's two separate issues. There's a need for landlord's consent from the owner of the building and then the need for planning permission. Now, which order the applicant decides to do that in is entirely up to them. As part of the application, they have notified the owners of the building that they are making a planning application on it. So from a planning point of view, they have satisfied their obligation to notify the relevant individuals. Now, if they were granting a, granted a planning permission by the committee today, that wouldn't overwrite the need to get the landowner's permission to carry out the alterations that a permission would grant. Okay. Number two was about um, the fact of the opening hours and the conditions like premises and remain closed and also external plant uh, between hours and hours to like namely 2300 hours to 900 hours the next day I know because we spoke I was speaking about Cassia two doors up that is open later I know that they we think they had like a previous licensing um, license so it could get carried over and that was all okay but the fact of the matter is uh, here sorry here here <laughs> uh, 
Um, if this was approved, then what could go to say that they could put in subsequent application for licensing? Because Cassia, two doors up, has a later license, and then they could just go apply for another later license and appeal this decision. Do you know? Do, do you know where I'm coming from on that? Okay. So, if permission was granted today. Um, it would be subject to the conditions that we impose, which is separate from the requirement um, for the applicant to go and, and, and receive a premises license for the building. Um, the licensing department will consult with us on that. They will consult with the environmental health team, and they can make a decision based on what they feel is appropriate for that particular site. Um, if they were granted a later license, we would then the applicant could apply to us to vary the condition on the planning application and at that point we would have to consider the merits of a later opening time at that particular site. So at the moment you have an application in front of you which you are considering the hours that are suggested within the conditions. Um, my concern is that um, in eventualities because of very close by properties having significantly later licenses like I said one two doors up there may be King's Ease and Drift around the corner and stuff What's the like if that did happen? What's the likelihood of having to overturn a decision here today? As as part of a license, uh, Claire may want to add to this, but I believe that they can consider the cumulative impact of other premises within the surrounding area and what impact that's having. So they will be considering the other um, licensed premises within the surrounding area. One of which I think has been referred to as Cassia, uh, which wasn't subject to a planning application because of its historic use. Um, as Snookies, I believe, as a cafe, and that has evolved. Um, so we, from a planning point of view, do not have any controls on the opening hours of that premises, and that is controlled purely through the licensing regime. With this one, we're looking to control the opening hours through the planning system, and that would be a material consideration when the licensing panel sits. Chair, if I may, um, on this issue of licensing, we, we have the licensing solicitor sat next to you. Is it worth him coming in on this point? Um, yeah. Uh, my colleague quite correct in the sense that you know, licensing rule here, what the planning application grants or doesn't grant, it is a liquor licence or a premises licence application that may or may not be made in the future, at which point the licensing committee will consider it as against the statutory obligations for granting a licence and also the fact that it's in an area of cumulative impact, which does have an overriding sort of effect upon applications for premises licence. Yeah? Now, if, for example, they granted a, a longer licensing hours beyond the current planning regime suggested, clearly they'd have to come back and make an application for variation, which may or may not occur in the future. Sorry, I was talking about more long term. I've, I'm probably just thinking of eventualities here. It's just all in my mind. I worry significantly well, about costs further down the line that the council might incur over this well, because I think about precedents that have been set from other venues. I wouldn't worry about the costs in terms of applications. The reality of the fact is that there is a consideration of comparables within a licensing area, cumulative area impact. The usual argument put forward to the licensing committee is that a change in your licensing regime does not affect the amount of cumulative impact in the area. And they would look at other premises as well. That's not to say that the ultimate decision is not vested with the license committee, which it is. Okay. Well, each case is looked at on a separate basis. But you're quite right; an application may or may not, and probably likely would be made. Councillor Peter Harris. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's more so on the point that Councillor you just brought up about opening times and closing times. Correct me if I'm wrong, but has there been uh, recently any case history where we've reduced the time, opening time or extended opening time and it's been overturned at appeal? I've not prosecuted any. I don't think we can think of any recent appeals where we um, haven't been able to defend the condition we've imposed. I, I'm, I'm more referring to the last one I can remember was Grove Road South. And that was about two years ago. And I didn't hear anything of that since. That was when we amended the opening time. So we haven't had any real case history on that since. Thank you. If, if I may, we, we've had a number of applications to extend opening hours on premises that I'm aware of that we have resisted. Um, I just don't think that the applicant has taken the, the route to appeal those decisions. Councillor Pitt. Um, yes, I'm slightly confused on this one because on... I can't find anywhere in the report 
any reference whatsoever to the sighting uh, or handling of waste, which I would think for an application for a restaurant is rather unusual. I can certainly remember a whole host of other times when we've gone to town on waste. I know that on the site plan they identify what looks to be enough room for two wheelie bins, um, but there's no comment on them. And if anything's going to impact on the amenity of the neighbours, it's stinking bins. So I would think that having some kind of detail other than two squares on a bit of paper might be helpful. And could we understand why that's not the case? Um, yes, I, I, the, the approved drawings show bin stores. Um, but if you feel that we need more detail of those, um, it is in an area that is enclosed and in the control of the applicant, and, and that's the only place on the site that they can actually store refuse. But if you want some more details on what the actual physical containers are, then yes, we could impose an additional condition if you wanted to recommend one. So just for clarity then, Gary, are you saying that the, you said enclosed, are you saying it's, it's within the actual building? No, sorry, it is within a rear yard, um, but it is a gated rear yard which isn't accessible by members of the public. So it's exclusive use of that building, it's, of it's that very difficult floor. to tell from there. But again, in terms of the ownership and the landlord's permission to use that area, they would also need the permission of the landlord in addition to any permissions that we grant here today. So, okay, just to be 100% clear, is it part of this application site or is it part of the whole property? The, I don't know the details of who has the right to use that fire escape. Certainly the um, external area is included within the application red line and therefore is within our control should we wish to impose conditions on refuse storage within those areas. And would that need to be done in consultation with the residents of the other properties since it's their shared space effectively? Um, from, a, from a site visit, it doesn't appear to be a shared space. It appears to be a fire escape, and residents have access through other parts of the building to their accommodation. Okay. Councillor Pitt, it depends on the status of the lease. So you'd look at the staircasing provisions in there and the schedules, and you'd find out who owns a reciprocal right of way across or in favour of. So you'd need to look at that first. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Peter, and sorry for uh, dragging this one out, um, but I just want to drill it right down. It's really important that we understand that it is going to be possible for them to effectively manage waste at this site. What could happen, could it not, is that they go ahead with the development and then we find out that the bins are being stored in a place that's both unacceptable to us and the other residents of the property, and therefore we have an ongoing problem, and having some clarity about that might make it more useful to us in considering the application. I'd suggest that if you're not satisfied that the plan itself adequately controls this position, then if you were minded to um, approve this application, you should add a, an additional condition requiring that we actually approve those details and then issues around ownerships and rights of ways can be f fully factored in in that discussion. Councillor Peter Harris. Um, on, just on that point, if Councillor Pitt wants to add that recommendation, I'm quite happy to support him. I am, and thank you. Other questions from members? I have a question um, from the chair. We have an ex existing extract duct between a metal fire escape which appears to run through the balconies of the upstairs properties. If this were to, to be replaced by an, the duct for an extractor fan, would this require the permission of those who are leasehold owners as well as of the freeholder, since this would appear to be the balconies of their own properties? Right, the first thing is to clarify, it doesn't run through the balconies. It runs through the voids in between the up and, and down runs of the, the staircase itself. In terms of its physical installation, yes, it would need landlord's consent again. We have considered as part of this the visual appearance of uh, an external flue and environmental health are happy with the location of that. But in terms of the physical installation, again, they would require the landlord's consent I don't know whether they require leaseholders' consent as well on, on that matter, but certainly they would require additional consent beyond the planning system. 
again, it depends on the nature of the grant to the to the tenant, uh, in the sense that what a landlord shouldn't do is derogate from the original grant when he did the lease in the first place. You need to look at those schedules again. Thus, if the original lease gave the tenants certain rights over the egress from the back of their properties, this um, would be a material consideration? Yes. No, I think it's... Sorry, I'm not disagreeing with you, Peter, but I think it's... We are saying that um, there, there are material planning considerations and land ownership isn't one of them. To make this development acceptable, we are putting on, uh, suggesting to you as members that we need to control certain aspects of that development and therefore we have put on planning conditions. If they are unable to meet those planning conditions and technically they can't properly implement the planning permission. So if we, hypothetically speaking, if we grant a planning permission this afternoon and we impose conditions such as they need to put in a um, extractor system that goes from A to B, then they will have to ensure that legally, in land ownership terms and lease terms, they can put that um, system in from A to B. And if they can't, then they will have to come back and uh, negotiate another solution that works effectively that they can actually deliver. If they're unable to deliver the condition, then they have an unimplementable condition, a uh, permission. I agree with Claire, happy with that. Councillor Jonas. Uh, well, it's a question and um, a comment, uh, Chairman. That is, I personally don't think there's enough information in uh, what's in front of us as to the waste um, collection uh, and area for the whole building. I mean, we looked at a little y yard there with a green wheelie pin in, and this is supposed to support a, uh, a, a kitchen. Um, what, what do the people above, where do they put their rubbish? I mean, they don't drop it out the windows down onto Marmion, and do they? Uh, onto Clarendon. Clarendon, no, onto the main road. I just think we're, we're not, we've not been given enough information. I'm concerned, as Councillor Pitt was, over that picture of where that waste was. And it, is it a big enough area? Do the officers think it's a big enough area for, for a, a commercial premises? If you're asking my professional opinion, is it a suitable location and is it of an adequate size to serve a relatively small cafe restaurants, then yes, I believe it is. Councillor Peter Harris. I have, to, I have to admit, it's come up again. I'm quite, I'm not satisfied by the information we've got here today. Councillor Pitt's been absolutely 100% correct on this, and so has my ward colleague, Councillor Jonas. I, I believe we should probably push to get more information on the, bin, on the bins because any other application we have, we have mountains of information from environmental health, and on this one we haven't got hardly anything. So it, it just seems, just seems inadequate to my, to my, to my mind, uh, and I believe we should look at this with more information. Can I just um, ask whether the committee, given that they are able to control this matter by a planning condition, and that therefore the officers would need to, to have additional information and satisfy themselves that there was an adequate arrangement, um, whether the committee could look at um, uh, granting delegated powers to get that additional information or granting them permission with a planning condition requiring that information to be submitted to us uh, prior to them commencing the use. On that point though Claire, when the information does come through, do we get to see that or does that go straight to you? You could choose to delegate it to me in consultation with the chair and vice chair if you chose to rather than bringing the application back to committee on this um, specific point, but ultimately that's your decision. So, so what you're saying is we're going to ask for this, and it's as a committee, the chair and the vice chair is going to get to see that and delegate it down to us to obviously have the information. So we actually don't get to really make a decision whether we're happy on the actual plan and consent that we're given. I believe that we could advise on the content of that condition and the, and the way in which delegation happens. I just wanted to uh, 
in Dawson to agree about the bins situation. We've had, I've had a number of complaints about uh, the backs of properties, a number of rats in the area, and uh, the, the amount of uh, uh, overflowing bins in Ashby Place and, and so forth recently, and, and uh, the backs of other um, restaurant premises in uh, St Jude Ward. And I think we do have to take a bit more um, action to make sure that we do have adequate space. And the space that's shown here is quite small, um, really. So I think it, I would suggest if we uh, did put our delegated powers on that, that we we we, we don't just leave it as sort of woolly, um, you know, more details on that. We need to see effective um, capacity for bins containing potentially... Um, unpleasant food waste or, or something similar because you, I, I walked around there yesterday and there it, there it is you do get a kind of nasty smell of old food around the backs of, in, the, in Ashby Place from other premises as well which isn't pleasant if you're living there or walking backwards and forwards Councillor Pitt OK, we've done the rubbish, now let's talk about the fire exits. Um, how do people get out of this thing? Uh, if there was a, the kitchen's now on the ground floor at the back it's situated, the door from the kitchen is situated adjacent to the lowest point where people actually come out of the flats upstairs from the fire exit, directly adjacent to a kitchen door, which we all know is very likely to be left open all the time, because that's what happens every time we put a condition on saying it shouldn't be. Um, and I'm just not quite clear how the hell people get out when they're, when they're upstairs, bearing in mind, I know the building very well, it's got a spiral mm. metal staircase in it. Um, so can we hear some more about how people are supposed to get out if it catches fire, please, for the residents and also for the restaurant? OK, I mean, again, I think we've had this discussion in, in previous planning committees, but not necessarily a matter just controlled through the planning system, although we will have regard to that issue. Um, in terms of the, the, the fire escape at the back of the building, yes, it, it does serve um, residential units above. Um, people using the restaurant itself would have the use of the emergency accesses, one through a kitchen um, and one through the front of the building. Again, given that it's a relatively small building, you should be able to get access to one of those. And again, the upper floor also has an access. In addition to the metal fire escape that runs um, up and down the building, I'm just trying to check that whether you can see it, but actually the fire escape does actually extend all the way around the back of this building. Um, and beyond them, and, and whilst we wouldn't consider that necessarily an appropriate means of access and egress in an emergency situation, that would provide additional external space for people to escape onto. But the second half of the question, Gary, was about the um, the proximity of the kitchen to the fire escape. So, the most likely place for a fire to start in a restaurant is the kitchen, and the only way that people can get out mm. the first floor <laughs> is onto the fire escape which descends to the kitchen. That's, I've never seen that proposed on a restaurant facility ever. Um, and having been, yeah, having been a consultant on, with a pub company for a number of years around premises safety, I just find that really, really odd. I agree, and it, it's not necessarily the best arrangement, but again, the residential units have a separate means of access to their own residential units. So in, in the unlikely event that there would be a fire in both of the accesses, because they have their own internal, the, the fire escape is a secondary, which prov provides effectively a back door from their, their own kitchens. So actually the kitchens for all of the residential units are located immediately adjacent to the fire escape. So there would be a means of escape through uh, what is a spiral staircase um, and wraps around a, a, a central sort of atrium within the flats themselves. Wrong one. <laughs> Councillor Udi. Um, sorry to go back to the bin situation, but putting my old pub hat back on, right? And I think St Steve would agree. Councillor Pitt, sorry. Um, the waste and cycling storage. Does that look like two kind of like flip over bins? Because really, you might be looking at maybe two biffer size bins, yes, like the big ones. Right, and. Um, and that doesn't look like that would fit there and you're probably having to put two piffer bins maybe on the, the space behind to actually adequately get waste storage because you're looking at general stuff because it's food and then bottle, or there'll be glass and probably cardboard provision with that as well. So there could even be free bins but the glass one might be a bit smaller than the actual other one. Do you know what I mean? 
just that, that was more like a comment, but just like trying to make people kind of more aware of that little bin provision, which obviously isn't enough, and they might have to move the bins outwards. If, if I may, I just I think one of the problems that the applicant has is this is a speculative planning application, so the intended occupier of the building is not known. If it was occupied as a cafe, then the refuse storage facilities may be very different to a licensed restaurant, for example. So a condition would allow us then to consider the type of use exactly that was going within that building and also they would have their own obligations to make sure that they manage refuse on that particular site. Question from the Chair. I have in front of me the memo um, from Environmental Health sent in on the 2nd of May 2018 which says, should you be minded to grant consent, I recommend the following conditions be applied. Can I be assured that the three conditions which environmental health have stated are encompassed in the uh, conditions which we see before us on page 17? I can confirm that all of the um, conditions that have been included within the recommendation have been agreed in consultation with the environmental health team. I did actually undertake a site visit with a member of the environmental health team and the conditions have been composed in consultation with them. So that wasn't quite the question I asked. The question I asked um, is there's some three specific things which are, are mentioned on their memorandum of the 2nd of May. Are these covered completely by the conditions, conditional permissions, which you have on page 17. Forgive me, I don't have a copy of the memo in front of me. However, following receipt of that memo, we have actually had further discussions and the conditions that we have are included. If you bear with me two seconds, I will. Certainly. Through. We've got to get this one right. Are there any further questions? Yes, Councillor Pitt. Thank you, Chair. Uh, moving on to the uh, one of the issues raised by the Environmental Health Officer, uh, and that is that the officer has raised the fact that there is no information provided. This is penultimate paragraph of his report on page 15. There is no information that's been provided as to the structure of the separate ceiling to the residential use above. Now, I'm aware of at least three other properties in the South Sea area where this, after the premises has opened, has caused massive problems for the residents living upstairs and for the business who didn't realise that they needed to consider this as part of their rebuild and uh, change of use. Is it sufficient that it's in the report and can that be a material consideration for refusal? Well, Gary can just confirm the uh, condition he's proposing to cover that issue, but in terms of whether or not it uh, would be a material reason for refusal, uh, as a planning committee you shouldn't be refusing, reason, uh, refusing things on the grounds of something that could be dealt with by a condition. So the issue around noise attenuation and the interrelationship between the commercial use and the residential use, and we know you know, there are some current live examples of this where it's not working, um, is something that um, we're suggesting can be dealt with by condition and satisfy ourselves that this could be controlled in, in a way that makes it acceptable to introduce this use um, below a residential use. Okay, so to follow up on that, uh, because I wasn't on the committee if other applications came to it about other premises that we are all aware of. Uh, is, are you confident that this, uh, that the, that condition was not applied on other premises where we have subsequently had problems?
Sorry, we're just um, comparing notes because it's not something we have on the top of our heads. Okay, so um, we have imposed conditions. It sounds as if on some we've had quite a long journey to get us to a point where what they've proposed and done deals with the issue, but the condition has been effective in achieving the right outcome. So that's where I was heading with all of this. Um, it's not to say that the intention is not there to deal with it, but it is fair to say that there have been other instances mm. where, although we've imposed a condition, there has been agreed that there has been considerable disruption to the neighbouring property while that condition was being reached. It, it sounds that is the case, yeah. Are there any further questions, members? We come to comment. Can we have uh, Councillor Peter Harris? I got in there first. Um, I know, it's first time for everything. Um, what I will say, Chair, um, I'm, I can't get past this inadequate information from Environmental Health on BIN, so on that note, I would like to push for a deferral so we can get some more information and then come back to the committee at a later date. Is that seconded? It's seconded by Councillor Jonas for deferral. Are there any other proposals to be made? Councillor Udi? Just a comment, sorry. What I can't get my head around, and I guess I'm going to learn this in my many, well, my four years of planning, I should imagine, maybe. Maybe I might choose to go licensing next time, maybe. It might be a bit easier. Um, <laughs> um, is that I can't get over that the freeholders not approve this, and then by judging by the deputation, he doesn't sound particularly happy for an this application's coming. I know it's got nothing to do with it, but when you think about it, it's just... In my mind, it's just incomprehensible, isn't it? It's just like, well, we could today we could approve this, but the freeholders are going to be like, no. Nah. Yes. What's well, that? Is the pos it's just it's, it's not. Yes, it's a lot of effort. which Councillor Elkham has made, but <laughs> without the benefit of microphone, <laughs> is that he could w put in a planning application to turn your your flat into a pub, and. Uh, we would have to consider it on planning grounds rather than on ownership grounds. Quite clearly, there are major ownership issues here. If Mr. Kitchen is correct that the, both the freeholder and the leaseholders and the tenants, uh, but especially the leaseholder, uh, object to parts of this application and that the freeholder has not been given his permission for the whole of it, it may not, on those grounds, go ahead. But we have to consider it as a plan on planning grounds. <coughs> Any other proposal? Councillor Peter Harris has proposed, Councillor Frank Jonas has seconded, that we defer this for further information on the in, uh, environmental health impacts uh, and whether the storage of waste is adequate for this, for the um, use proposed. That is correct, Councillor Peter Harris? Yes. Councillor Jonas? Right. Chair, before we vote on that, I think Councillor Pitt made quite a valid point about the fire escape being next to the kitchen. Do we want to include that in our deliberations? Uh, part of the additional information? I'm, I'm happy to add that in, Chair. And so we add the additional one on the um, on the safety of the fire escape itself uh, as a means of egress from the first floor above the kitchens. With those additions, can I see those in favour of deferral? Those against? Those abstaining? that we have voted for a deferral NEMCON and we will seek the further information and this will come back to the committee for a, a determination when we have that information. I would like to thank Mr Kitchen for his deputation and urge him to um,
to uh, speak with the landlord and the hope that we can get uh, some clarity on the matters, although not planning matters, which are pertinent to this application. Thank you. We have one major and one minor application coming up. Um, do you wish to have a 10 minute break or shall we plough ahead? We are, the general consensus is that we plough ahead and go to um, 19 Powers Court Road. Sorry? Uh, Mr. Venables, you are Mr. Venables? Thank you very much. the officer's report, please. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, members. Uh, this application relates to number uh, 19 Powers Court Road, uh, which is a mid-terrace property with four storeys of accommodation located close to its intersection with uh, Kingston Road. The proposal seeks to vary condition 5 of a previously approved plan and uh, permission to increase the occupation of the property from seven unrelated individuals to eight. The above images show the uh, front and rear elevations of the property. Uh, the property is set back from the highway by a small forecourt and has a larger garden to the rear. Existing bin and bicycle storage um, is, is located to the front and the rear cartilage of the property. This slide and the floor plans in front of you indicate how the property would be laid out over four floors. The applicant has proposed to convert the uh, ground floor lounge to form an additional bedroom measuring 10.5 metres squared and this would be um, accessed as well by an ensuite which uh, measures 2.93 metres squared. There are no other proposed alterations to the layout of the property as previously approved in January 2018. The determining issues in the application are whether the variation of condition to enable the occupation of the premises by eight unrelated individuals rather than seven would provide a suitable standard of living accommodation for future occupiers and whether the increase of one additional occupant would have a significant impact on the residential amenities of neighbouring occupiers. The previously approved lounge at ground floor level has been converted but is yet to be occupied. Um, this provides an additional bedroom and there is an ensuite as well. The amended HMO SPD uh, requires that a bedroom for single occupancy should be 7.5 metres squared or above. The bedroom has adequate light ventilation and outlook as well as storage space and a lockable door. The, uh, the SPD also outlines that a combined living space for seven or more persons must have a minimum floor area of 27 metres squared. These images just highlight the existing layout at lower ground floor level and the, um, the cooking facilities as well as recreational facilities provided. Um, the kitchen living space measures 34 metres squared which is seven metres above the required standard. Um, again, this space provides adequate seating areas, light ventilation and is compliant with both planning and licensing standards. There are adequate sanitary facilities provided throughout the property. Just a slight correction from the committee report, there are actually six en suites in one communal shower room as opposed to five en suites in two communal shower rooms. Um, externally, there's secure weatherproof bicycle storage, three to the front and up to five in the back. External um, seating area, four refuse bins and two recycling bins. Um, 
the proposal to increase the occupation of the property to eight individuals rather than seven is considered to be acceptable and would provide a suitable standard of living accommodation for future occupiers. And based on the proposal's compliance with size standards and the outcome of recent appeal decisions, the recommendation is for conditional permission. Thank you. Mr Venables, you have six minutes. Uh, good afternoon. I'm one of the owners of this property. We are experienced landlords with a number of properties throughout the North End. Uh, we have active members of the NLA and PDPLA, amongst other organisations. We finish all of our properties to the very highest standards, which I hope is shown in the photos. As you've been told, we meet all of the planning requirements for this application. In addition, this property has been signed off by both Building Control and the Fire Department, who has done their own individual assessment. We've actually gone above and beyond the requirements from a building control and licensing point of view. Some examples are uh, our fire alarm system is an addressable system with emergency call points, emergency lighting throughout the building, which is far beyond what is required. We install humidistat ventilation systems, which is, trig tri which is triggered by humidity, so none of our tenants will ever have to experience condensation and damp issues. Each bedroom is on their own electrical ring, so if a tenant trips the fuse, only their bedroom goes off and doesn't disturb the other tenants. We have a commercial plumbing system in place, which means all showers can run hot and at pressure, all at the same time, so none of our tenants will ever have a cold shower. We have installed additional fire protection in the communal area to further protect the tenants. We have installed additional ventilation throughout the ground floor to aid tenants' comfort. We always make sure we have a communal bathroom, which is electric, so if any, of, any tenant has an issue with their ensuite or the boiler fails, they will never have to go without a hot shower. Furniture is strategically placed to minimise disturbance to other residents. This is only a few of the measures we have taken to ensure our tenants are as comfortable as possible. We also run our own lettings agents, and so we are in full control of how the properties are managed. Every property is checked every week for cleanliness, additional unlawful occupants, maintenance issues, fire alarm tests and waste issues. This ensures no issue can manifest and become an issue to the local neighbourhood or other tenants. We offer our properties to any tenant who pass our stringent checks and no matter what age, even Rinkley's. We are asking to accommodate one further tenant and the communal area is well above the standards so there, should, there would be minimal impact in the shared areas and the current parking issues. We take being a landlord extremely serious and we are doing everything we can to provide the very best accommodation in Portsmouth. I hope this is evident and that the application can be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, questions? Councillor Jonas. Could the officers confirm on page 20 that the three um, paragraphs are actually A, inadequate parking provision, that doesn't apply, B, the large number of HMOs, it doesn't apply because it's not exceeding the limit, and therefore C, the implications of construction work is not really a plan and application. Are those three, you'll agree with those three that they're all yeah. negative? Yeah, yeah I agree. Thank, yeah. thank you. Other questions, members? Any comments? Councillor Pitt and then Councillor Jonas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is the third time I've sat on this property uh, in the last however long it was since it first came up. So I remember very well the reasons why it was refused the first time around, and that was because the basement uh, was lacking it was felt in the committee's opinion on that occasion in natural light. So when it came back, what is now shown as bedroom number one was the application was amended from eight persons to seven persons and bedroom number one was shown as a living room, um, although I seem to remember commenting on the time that a living room with an ensuite on it was waiting to be a bedroom. And now here we are and it's a bedroom. So the reasons why the refusal was made in the first place are, in my opinion, exactly the same as the reasons for insisting now that this remains a living room because the subterranean living, which is the only communal space, is semi-underground. The light is limited. It combats it, comes through that one strip window at the end. That's the only natural light available. Um, it's just not appropriate for us to change the decision of this committee under a year ago 
uh, when we said that we wanted a ground floor living space with natural light on it to provide sufficient uh, communal living for the residents. This one is not about size, it's about amenity. Uh, maybe on this occasion others would take a different opinion, but on that occasion this committee decided that it wanted to see ground floor communal space. That happened, that's why it was granted, and now it's back here removing that room and reverting to what was effectively the original application, and for that reason I'll be opposing it. Councillor Jonas. Like Councillor Pitt, I've sat on this uh, one, two or three times. I think we have to agree that the standard of accommodation is uh, one of the highest of HMOs that uh, has ever come before us. Um, my only well, I won't be surprised if we uh, revisit this in a year's time and they found another space somewhere. But uh, on this present uh, application, I would recommend officers' recommendations. Councillor Peter Harris, then Councillor Udi. Um, if I recall, Chair, I think this was heard back in January. I'm just going through my notes now. I think it was yourself, actually, that mentioned about the communal living space and the natural light originally. On that basis of the application, I was happy to proceed in January because obviously they'd taken out the extra room and gone with the seven. And Councillor Pitt's right, they have just reverted back to what the, was the original application just to get it through to the committee. Um, and on that basis, I, I think we need to support the committee on their previous decision and uphold what we did last time. Councillor Udi, then Councillor Stubbs. Well, I didn't know any of this till just now, so thank, thanks. Um, were you seconding, Steve, or not? I'd quite happily defer it to you if you want to. <laughs> Don't be a dick. Right, sorry. I um I want to second Steve Pitt's recommend. Uh, Councillor Pitt, sorry. Councillor Pitt. <laughs> just being formal, Chair. Claire, I'm sure he's been called worse. <laughs> I want to second Pitt's uh, second. <laughs> it's the heat, it's the heat, it's been weak. Pitt, Pitt, Pitt the younger. I'm aware, I can see the effect that the heat is having on the committee this it's been afternoon. Weeks. And it's summer holidays now as well. I'd like to second, I'd like to, yeah, second uh, Councillor Pitt's proposal. Um, I'm quite, I'm literally, I was just kind of like in the two minds, like I spoke on earlier, HMOs, about the fact that, well, we do need housing, but at the same time we have um, developers coming in trying to maximise profit, and here is like a prime example of that, and um, they're trying to revert back, and I'm really sorry, but I do have to um, agree with Councillor Pitt, and I formally second him. Councillor Stubbs. Uh, I don't think um, Councillor Jonas's proposition has been seconded yet, has it? Um, so I was just speaking to say I'm happy to second that. Councillor Elkham. Yeah, I think, you know, we're back to Wadham Road in, in a different guise, aren't we? It's cram them in for maximum profit. At least one bedroom, bedroom seven, is only a square metre above, above the minimum. So whilst the finish might be good, we're talking about we're only this bit over the minimum size. So it is cram them in, make the most profit. Uh, having said all that, I think you know we know what the planning inspector's view is. Will one more person make a difference? And I suspect the planning inspector will certainly say it doesn't. But uh, as back to my old hobby horse of earlier on, it's that you know unfortunately we're not rulers of our own destiny anymore. Uh, we have to defer to the planning inspector in Bristol. Um, but I'm not happy with it and. Uh, I think I'd be lacking in consistency if I didn't follow the same line as I did earlier. By earlier, you do mean earlier in this meeting or in January? Earlier this meeting and in January. Just, just, just a point of order, in January, um, Councillor Alcombe had a very big chain on. <laughs> oh yes, so he did. <laughs> Councillor Pitt. Yeah, just for clarity, Chair, I'm not recommending refusal on the basis of the extra bedroom being an issue in itself. Mm -hmm. I'm re recommending refusal on the same basis that the committee refused the application before, which was about residential amenity around the light issue and our de clear desire to want to see a room retained on the ground floor for living space because, as I mean, you can't deny it looks amazing, and I, for one, probably wouldn't mind living there, but the fact of the matter is it wouldn't be me and my other half and our dog. It will be seven adults, and the only natural light in there, if you look at the top right picture, 
that's not light above the work surface, that's light that is above the, the sofas that are shown in the bottom right picture. So that is the only light in that area. The rest of that whole communal space is entirely dependent on artificial light. That's the reason we gave at the time, and that's the reason for recommending refusal now, uh, for proposing refusal now rather, is not to do with use, uh, adding the additional bedroom, for which I completely agree we would have no material grounds for doing so. Any other comments? Yes, Councillor Smythe. I believe there are um, rules about uh, from build, building regulations about light. Um, d does this layout infringe those rules, or am I wrong that there are any rules about it? I haven't liaised directly with the building regulations department, but I think Mr. Venables has outlined that it has building regulations approval. Yeah, we'll it has building uh, regulations. The, Yes. There are two natural light windows, and yes, it has been signed off by Building Control as adequate. And do they both allow um, fresh air to come in? Yep, both are um, operational, and one is also fire escape as well. Second window is just to the uh, the rear of the amenity space. That's here. Are there any further comments from members? I've lost it. It's the heat. Was the proposition from Councillor Jonas first or Councillor Pitt first? Councillor Pitt, I think. Councillor Pitt has proposed refusal. Those in favour of refusal on the grounds of amenity, please show. For those against, please show. Four. Right. Um, we therefore would move to the proposal to accept the officer's recommendation from Councillor Jonas. Um, those in favour of accepting the officer's recommendation, please show. Those against of the officer's recommendation, please show. Right. We are now in a slight conundrum in that the proposal to refuse um, was tied, the, ref the officer's recommendation was lost. The position of the chair, therefore, as the casting vote, is always to go with um, keeping the matter open for further discussion. Therefore, I have to go with Councillor Pitt on this, that the matter should not be approved at this point. So it is not approved. Thank you. On grounds of immunity. So, so it's refused? It'll be yeah. refused, okay. Technically it's refused, but in fact, um, had I moved otherwise, I would have kept, I would have closed off the matter, which... Right. So, um, just to confirm, the reason for refusal is that the um, proposed additional room was, would uh, create a poor quality living condition and satisfactory living accommodation. We're tie tied up with all the words that were in the previous review. And refer back to the, dis the uh, decision which was made earlier. Yeah. You're making it difficult for the chairman this afternoon, aren't you? Cool. <laughs> No, I didn't. <laughs> That's to, to, be, to be fair, Councillor Mason, when myself and Councillor Jonas had it, we had never had this trouble. No, I know you didn't. Um, we now come to 5 Leland Road, which is brought before us. Can we have um, the officer's report on 5 Leland Road?
this. I've had to do that on, yeah. on, on, the, on the chairman's. It's usually twice in a year. It is. But you know, I, this is the line I will always take. I'm afraid that I. Do you have to do that? Or was that conventional? It is. No, there was no rule on it. But it is generally conventional that it is chairman's best practice. If there is a tied vote, you'll use your casting vote to keep the matter open for further consideration. Um, you'll find this, I think... At that point, it would be refusal, yes. You'll f I, uh, yeah, that allows it to be reconsidered and... Uh, some Good afternoon. This application relates to 5 Leland Road. Um, it's noted that this has come to committee due to um, the applicants uh, being a close family member of a planning officer. Um, the application relates to a detached chalet bungalow located to the east side of Leland Road. Um, the block plan here indicates the position uh, for a pro proposed single storey outbuilding. It's a substantial rear garden and it is separated by council owned land um, of about a, f a width of approximately four metres, um, which backs onto uh, the rear gardens of Copsey Grove. Its principal elevation shows the chalet bungalow from the front, fronting Leland Road. Um, the elevation shows just the re-elevation of the house and kind of gives you an idea of the size of the, the garden. Um, the plans show um, it would have a maximum height of 2.8 metres. It's noted that an outbuilding could be constructed without the need of planning permission to a height of 2.5 metres, but the applicant wishes to have a pitched roof to make it look a bit nicer, so therefore may have to come in for planning permission. Um, we've got a picture of a rear garden. Construction work has started, um, but you can see kind of uh, how large the garden is there. Um, as I said, it backs onto council-owned land, um, and those are the rear gardens of Copsey Grove. There's a small substation there. It uh, just shows a boundary treatment with number seven, Leland Road, so we've got a large amount of foliage um, and a substantial gap there. And then again, boundary treatment to three, Leland Road, with um, a high boundary fence and again, a high uh, level of foliage to the back. All other issues are set out in the report and it's our recommendation for con uh, conditional permission subject to conditions. Sorry, can I just doubly confirm the um, officer who is related to the applicant is not an officer that's present at this committee? Questions, members? Just in case the surname. Sorry, just in case the surname. Yeah, there's a surname of Brown, so I just I, I, wanted to clarify that. Can you clarify you. that's not related to you, Claire? Is that what you're saying? No. Um, we can 100% confirm that that is not the case. Um, just, just, just to make things clearer and following on from what Claire said, um, I need to make a declaration as monitor officer as follows. I, Peter Bolf, Deputy City Solicitor and monitor officer, confirm that this application is being made by a close relative of a planning officer. And I confirm in accordance with paragraph 511 of the Council's Code for members and officers in respect of planning matters that as far as I am aware, this planning application has been processed normally. Thank you. Questions, members? Councillor Elkham. Thank you. The report mentions that this building could be used to store a vintage car. Have we got any idea how they're going to get the thing in there? Does that mean they've got right away over that lane at the back or not? 
Um, the applicant has applied for Portsmouth City Council land permitted vehicular access route license, which is part of the application, um, and that's all been approved. Right, okay. Move the officer's recommendation. Do I have a second there? Second. Yes, Councillor Stubbs. Any further discussion? Those in favour, please show. That is unanimous. Thank you very much. That, I believe, concludes the entertainment for this afternoon. Thank you, members, for making my life difficult. Um, and thank you even more for making the life of the planning officers difficult. That's what we're here for.